I'm, first things first, uh, with tonight, I'm going to go ahead and give myself this caveat. I apologize, I have not had the uh, normal amount of time I would have to prepare. So if I seem a little disorganized at some moments tonight, I do apologize, but I do just wanna throw that out there. Um, but tonight, I wanna talk about a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is actually based off of a presentation I gave here a couple years ago. I don't blame you if you don't remember. I hardly remember sometimes. But this is a topic that I was introduced to in college, uh, really for the first time truly in depth studied in college. And it's one that truly affected me. I really came away from the study, well, I felt like I really knew more about God by the end of it. And it's a topic that we sometimes touch, we sometimes don't, but it's one I want to talk about a little bit in depth tonight. And that is what I like to call the Book of the Twelve. The Book of the Twelve. Would anybody have a guess on what I'm referring to with that? Acts. Not Acts. Apostles. Not the Apostles. The minor prophets. Bingo. The Minor Prophets. The Minor Prophets. I am a minor prophets guy through and through. If you remember a couple weeks ago, I somehow managed to work Hosea into a marriage sermon. I love the minor prophets. It is one of my favorite things to discuss and talk about. It's a part of scripture we don't touch often, but I think reading it in this way I want to present tonight gives us a better reason overall, like why we should pay them attention. And I just want to start with a couple little things just to kind of get your brain into the idea tonight. First, generally, why do we call them minor prophets? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the whole reason. They're just generally shorter in length. I mean, you have Obadiah, that's a whopping 21 verses in there. I mean, it takes up a singular page in your Bible. They're just generally shorter prophets that we don't have as much information on and that you can read through them like that. It's not a huge thing. But I guess my quest next question is, why would I and some scholars refer to them as the Book of the Twelve? Well, there's 12 of them. Yeah. Well, I think it, that's going to be a big thing we talk about tonight. Oh, yeah, Jeff. Yes, that's a big part of it. I think as we walk through it tonight, you're going to see why I like to refer to them as the Book of the Twelve, or at least get an idea of generally starting why. But to begin that, I want to talk about modern books today versus ancient books around the time these were written. So when you think of a modern book, what ideas pop up? One of the first ones that pop up in my head is, well, they're coherent works, right? They're singular. They have one thing they're trying to get across. And generally speaking, at least a good book is coherent, right? It has a purpose, an idea, a thought behind it that is conveyed clearly. Also, they have things like authorial intent, right? The author does not just write the book with no reason to write it. He writes the book sometimes. But to, generally speaking, authors write books with intent. And then, obviously, you have things like publications and copyrights and all this other stuff, right? Today, writing a book is a much more process than it was in the ancient world. A lot of your books and your Bible are just... Well, things people were writing down as they saw them. It's not some big, grand, okay, I'm going to write this, send it off to my editor, get it back, redo the edit, send it back, get this, get that, sign this deal. There's none of that. Ancient books are much different. One, you have individual books a lot of times, right? Like I said, I referred to Obadiah and its whole 21 verses. We wouldn't consider that a book today. We would consider that a page. But it's called a book because it has a idea, it was written about something that happened. They consider that a book, however long or short. Two, you have things like codexes, where they gather a whole bunch of those one-off pages and roll them together 
and call it a codex so you can refer to things. And they categorize them, and they talk about them, and they write in them in a way we really don't. And you have things like scrolls, like Jeff referred to earlier, where they write it out, and they write down these big, long scrolls. And they write more than one work on this scroll. Um, there's a few examples of these kinds of things in the biblical text. Uh, can somebody grab Genesis 5.1? Um, who wants that one? Because I'm going to get three of this. Okay, Blaine, take Genesis 5.1. Who wants Numbers 5.23? Andrew? And then can somebody grab Luke 4.20? Okay, Clint. Genesis 5.1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. The day that God created man, he made it in the life of God. The book, the genealogy of Adam. It's just where scripture references this idea of ancient books. Who had the numbers 523? Andrew, right? Can you go ahead and read that? Numbers, reading a scroll of curses. Uh, Clint, can you grab Luke 420 for me? And Jesus reads the scroll of Isaiah, right? He doesn't read the book like we would. Yes, Ms. Garrett. Well, I was going to say, if you go back to verse 17, it refers to Isaiah as a book. Mm-hmm. It says that he handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Mm-hmm. Where they scrolled it. Mm-hmm. But it just, Scripture refers to these ideas, right, these ancient books, because it's set in its own context where this was how they well, talked about this information. But if this is how things were gathered, they were brought together, and they weren't all, you know, they started off as 12 individual prophets who had 12 individual times preaching, and then they wrote them down. When did we get this book, this gathering of these 12 prophets? Like, when would somebody have taken... Hosea and Malachi and going, you know what, those might go together. Because that's where this forms. Rabbis and scholars, Hebrew scholars in particular, around probably roughly maybe 100 years or so, it, it's kind of flexible. We don't have an exact date. You start seeing these books pop up about 100 years after the last one of them got done preaching. Why, like, but when does that happen exactly? Any guesses? Yeah, that's one theory. The question is there, or the answer is there is no real answer. Uh, there's not like a definitive, it happened X day. Or you start seeing it X day. They dig, the, they dig up copies of these all the time, and they're a little dated a little differently. But there's a couple just generally accepted ideas. So you start seeing them referred to in oracles from prophets around the 5th to 8th century. Jeremiah actually refers to them in some ways. Um, you see them start being collected into volumes around 100 years, like I was saying. Similar to how the gospel started getting gathered together, about 100 years after Christ and the, tw- you know, the 12 started preaching and teaching, and you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John write their gospels, you start about 100 years after that, you see people start putting them together, like, hey, these four books go together? Well, about 100 years-ish after the Minor Prophets, you start seeing these occurrences where, well, hey, these kind of go together, and people start putting them in collections. And, you know, you have multiple groups who do this. And the funny part is, too, you don't always have the same group of 12. Sometimes it's 10. Sometimes it's 6. Sometimes the orders are shifted around, right? It's not Hosea, Joel, Amos. It might be Amos, Joel, Micah. They start shifting. You know, it didn't really come to the 12 we have right at first. But... Around 200 BC, we really start to see the version we have start to crystallize and really form together. Now, you still have some differences between how they're ordered. 
Um, the LXX and MT, that is the Septuagint, Septuagint and the Masoretic text. One's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. The other is just the Hebrew reading of the Old Testament. They both kind of order them a little different, but they're both, those 12 books are all there. But this issue comes ordering. How, what orders these 12 books? Like, why would they get them, you know, Hosea, Joel, Amos, go down the list. Why would they order them that way? Should they order them that way? Any theories on what would order them? Mm-hmm. Within, within a lifetime of it happening, yeah. Well, chronology is one theory that's commonly thrown out there, but then the question becomes, what about Joel? The problem, a lot of people have issues dating Joel because Joel just doesn't make any specific references to history. Joel is very much ambiguous about when it takes place. My next, but if it's not that, is it maybe key words? I'm, t I'm going to tell you, I fall very much so in this camp. Key words, key ideas, key themes that keep popping up throughout each book. Because if you go do a word study of the book of the 12 or the minor prophets, you start seeing ideas and images repeat and connect. And we'll, we'll talk about it more. And... It could be the Hebrew and Greek of it, you know, because you have the Septuagint and some things like that. Uh, but it boils down to the same issue. They both kind of place Joel differently. Like I said, Joel is the one that kind of gives everybody issue as far as where do we stick it. I think there is a reasoning behind the way we have them ordered, though. Can anybody guess what that reasoning is? I did tip my hand a little bit earlier, but I did not fully... I guess, give it away. Well, I think there's a movement. I think there's a starting point and an ending point to the book of the 12. When you start in Hosea and get to Malachi, I think it's trying to tell you something, show you something. Now, there's three key points to this movement I want us to kind of look at tonight. Can anybody guess what the first point is? Starts with an S. It's a three letter word. We talk about it a lot. Sin. Sin marks the first big movement of the book of the 12. Let me catch up in my own notes here. <clears throat> I really got ahead of myself. So, sin is the first big movement, right? Because let's back up a little bit. Historically speaking, like, anybody know when these books are kind of taking place? Hosea is before the destruction of Israel, so we're not to exile quite yet. Question, is the kingdom united or divided? They're divided, right? You have the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And you're talking like 720-ish B.C. And, well, it's a time of idolatry and sin in both nations. Particularly the northern nation of Israel is much more trenched in that. But that's where you're at in history. Israel is unfaithful to its God. And this first movement of sin marks Hosea through Micah. It is a solid chunk of these 12 books. And I want to read through a couple pa passages tonight just to kind of highlight that idea. Can somebody read Hosea chapter 4, verses 7 through 8? Who wants that one? Okay, Blaine, Hosea 4. Can somebody also grab Micah chapter 3, verse 8? Micah chapter 3. All right. Blaine, can you go with Hosea for me? Oh, all right. Verse 
verses 7 and 8. This, this passage Blaine just read for us comes from this case God's making against Israel. And he's talking about how much they've sinned and how much of a problem it is and what's going to happen about it. Uh, Tracy, you had Micah chapter 3, verse 8. Micah chapter 3, verse 8 says, But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah 3, verse 8 highlights the same idea. Throughout these first handful of books in the book of the 12, sin is the focus. Israel, Judah, you have sinned, and it's a problem. Hosea. Hosea is a book very much grounded in one thing. You have been unfaithful to the Lord your God. And we'll talk about it a little bit more tonight, but it marks the beginning of that discussion on, you've separated yourself from me. You've been unfaithful. It's because of your sin. And Micah starts to highlight your sin's going to cause issues. And you're going to be separated. But we have the sin movement. What would come after the sin? Bingo. It's punishment. Punishment. God gets to a point with his nation, with his people, he says, I can't let this go on anymore. I have to do something about the problem. And it is punishment. Now, this marks Nahum through Zephaniah. These books, well, are dealing with that punishment. Because going back to our history discussion, what happens, does anybody know what happens at this time, roughly, of these prophets, particularly to the northern nation? Assyria takes them captive and exiles them. Now, do they ever recover? Not totally. Not totally. If you remember, and this bring, comes up in Acts, if I remember correctly, the diaspora, the Jews that have been scattered out to all the nations, it finds its start here. Because Assyrian captivity is particularly brutal. They don't just take you from your homeland, your country, and move you somewhere else. They take you and they separate you out. You don't get to move as one whole people group. You get to move as a little chunks of people groups all over the place. And they never truly recover. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sin is a problem throughout all the books, yes. And punishment is a thing throughout all the books. But I guess my overall point here with these books in the sin section, these books in the punishment section, their focus overall is on, well, sin or punishment. All right? Because, yes, the first two chapters of Malachi deal with their sin. But overall, I believe the book deals with their restoration. Because the book does end with them looking forward to a time when a prophet is coming back to them. Because that is the final movement of the book of the 12, I think. You get to, well, Haggai through Malachi, right? To fast forward the history a little bit more, Judah's gone off into captivity at this point and returned during this time. And during this time, they start to try to come back to God. And they have their problems, don't we all, when we try to come back to God? And God works with them on it, right? But he continually promises restoration. Can somebody read Haggai chapter 2, verses 20 through 23? And if somebody else wants to read something, can somebody grab Malachi chapter 3, 16 through 18? Who wants which? Andrew? Malachi? Jeff, Haggai, chapter 2, 
verse 20 through 23. So there at the end of Haggai, the Lord takes this, the Lord takes this governor, named Zerubbabel, and the Jewish nation will never have a king again. Not after exile, not after they've come back. They have governors. This guy is a governor for the Medo-Persian Empire for them. His name is Zerubbabel. And God says he's going to restore him and make him a signet ring. I think God does do that. It just doesn't take the form of restoration in that moment. Zerubbabel is in the ancestry of Jesus, eventually. You know, some hundreds of years after him. But God's promising restoration. Uh, Andrew, you had the Malachi passage? Uh, 3, 16 through 18, yes. God here, towards the end of Malachi, is talking about bringing them back to him, restoring them to him. And I think this is the overall emphasis of those last little handful of books, is that God's going to bring you back and restore you. Now, I don't think the fulfillment of that happens till quite some time later, right? But I think that's kind of the point overall, is that you're moving from the sin, this punishment, to this restoration, and you're waiting on it. And that's kind of, I think, what the minor prophets are getting at.
and I can see how it can be read that way, but I think part of the image there too, right? He talks about purifying Levi, purifying them, making them restored. Mm. I would push back on that a little bit because of where it sits and what it's looking forward to. I'm not trying to say the restoration's right there in that moment, but even there at the end, with the reference to Elijah, it's looking to the restoration. He's trying to prepare them. And I think that's what Haggai through Malachi is about. It's that restoration. And in some sense, it does happen, right? They do rebuild the temple. They do get, in the Jewish thought, their access to God back. They are a restored people in some sense. I'm not saying the restoration is full. But what I am trying to say is there is a sense of restoration that comes with these books. And I think that's what the minor prophets are trying to get across. We have our land back. We have our God back. We have a way to him again. Jeff? But the restoration is always just one of the Mm-hmm. It's not the restoration of the kingdom. No. No, they never completely recover. I mean, you get 400 some odd years later by the time of Christ, and what are they? They're just a, really a small Roman <laughs> province. Anything else? If not, I kind of want to walk through this, this, this overall narrative of the 12. What each book kind of has its piece as. And this is where we're going to do a lot of reading. This is where I didn't have time to you know, really sit down and prepare today, but we'll do it. I want to start with Hosea. That, okay. Hosea is really about connections and answers about, well, disrupted covenants, right? Um, what is, like, the centering relationship in Hosea? Like, what? Marriage, right? It's really about marriage. And what do we know about Hosea's marriage? It is not good, Right? He's married to Gomer. And what is Gomer's profession? A prostitute. If there's a broken marriage, that's it. But why does God have Hosea do that in the book? As an example. To point out how the Jews had treated God. Yes. Their right. To him was it's a it's what's called a prophetic reenactment, right? You see Ezekiel do this kind of thing in his book. But it's just to show, you see how his life is broken and damaged? That's our relationship right now, because you've driv driven this wedge of sin between us. You have been unfaithful to me with God such as Baal. And Hosea is a lot about, well, drawing that line. Our covenant is disrupted. Our covenant has come apart. Um, I didn't really have, like, a passage for that one, because I can't have us read the first three chapters of Hosea tonight. But I just wanted to throw that out there, walk through it a little bit. Joel. Joel outlines this threat of sin in very, I guess my best word for it was cosmic terms. Joel is very imagery-based. It paints a lot of pictures. Um, can somebody read Joel 2.2? 2, 2? Joel chapter 2, verse 2. Joel, too, is talking about this, well, coming result of sin, which does take form in judgment. And it's very strange image, especially if you read the whole chapter there, which sadly we don't have time for tonight. The reason I picked Joel 2, too, is this ultimately connects to Zechariah a little later on. And some of the images from Hosea in particular do connect to Malachi. Um, like I said, it's something we'll talk about more at some point. But I just wanted to throw that out there. That Joel is very odd, hence why people kind of struggle to place it sometimes, date-wise. And it talks about this result of sin in very different terms. The next book, Amos. Well, it, it begins that implementation of the previous threats by God. Right? He's, you've sinned, you've broken our relationship, and this is what will happen if you don't turn from it. 
And it does conclude with this image of hope and restoration, but only if you handle one thing, your sin. Can somebody read Amos 9? It's the very end of the book here. Can somebody get to Amos chapter 9 and read verses 8 through 10? Verses 8 through 10. Who? Yes, ma'am, Miss Lanfear. So, with what Miss Lamphere just read, the emphasis is your sinful kingdom, and for that, for your sin, destruction will come. But thankfully, Amos does not leave it off there. Uh, can read with me Amos nine verse fifteen. I will plant them on their land, and they will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them. The Lord your God has spoken. It comes at the end of the book, where Amos talks about what could happen. If you just stopped sinning, God can restore you. God can fix the problem. But your sin has to cease. And this moves us to Obadiah. And Obadiah picks up an interesting spot because, question, who is God sending this prophet to? Edom. It's not Israel necessarily. It's not Judah. It's a different nation completely, right? Right? And he's not the only minor prophet to do this. And Obadiah does kind of pick up where Amos left off. Edom, you are sinful and you will be destroyed. Return to God or be destroyed. Stop sinning. And it just continues the idea of this coming judgment for sin. Let me see what passage I pulled for this. Sorry. Uh, Can somebody just read Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1? Obadiah 1.1 starts with this, well, God's going to send an envoy and he's declaring war on Edom. Punishment's coming because of your sin. And this brings us to the next book, Jonah. We, we, we talk about Jonah a good bit, we do. All four whopping chapters. But it kind of picks up with something that Obadiah did. Is Jonah about Israel necessarily? No, right? They're, they're not the actual focus of the book as far as who's being preached to on the surface. right? It's Nineveh. And what do we know about Nineveh? Assyrians. Assyrians. The very nations God's going to use to destroy Israel. And Jonah doesn't like them. He doesn't want to preach to them. He eventually does. But the, the odd part about Jonah is not... Jonah being swallowed by the great fish and this, that, the other. It's the fact that the Assyrians repent. They do the one thing Israel's failing to do. They repent for their sin. Jonah acts as the solution to the problem God's been pointing at. And he uses an Israelite to show the problem they've had. Right? Jonah the Israelite doesn't repent in the book. Much rather, the entire Assyrian capital does. Jonah may have preached to Nineveh, but it was meant to be a message to Israel and Judah as well. Maybe you should act more like them and stop sinning and repent to your God, because they did. But your sin still separates you. And then this brings us to Micah. All right. This is where Assyria really comes into the picture. Because God uses Assyria as this big symbol for all these nations. 
But if God can forgive Nineveh for their sin, Israel, Judah, he can still forgive you. He can still forgive you. Can somebody pull Micah chapter 7? Micah chapter 7, we're going to be verses 18 through 20. Who wants to read that? Tracy. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from days of old. Here at the end of what, we would, what I would call the sin movement, Micah gives one last call. God can forgive your iniquity. He can cast it all off to the sea. Make it no more. You just have to come back to him. Micah really points to the face. You can come back. Your sin can be forgiven. But we have Nahum. And Nahum is where God's raising up Assyria. And they're going to destroy Israel. They're going to level it to the ground. And if he does this for Assyria, he can do it for Israel and Judah. He can raise them up too. But punishment's coming. God has to do something about the problem of sin. Can somebody uh, look with me? Let me see. Sorry. Nahum chapter 1, 12 and 13. Well, yes, in some sense, but do you notice the fact that he says, look how I've raised them up. I could do the same for you. They're going to punish you, but it could have been you. And this brings us to Habakkuk. And this is where we've had a shift a little bit. Assyria is no longer your, I guess, big bad nation on the scene. Much rather, it's their brother nation, Babylon. And Habakkuk really deals with this problem of, God, why would you raise them up? Why would you raise up this wicked people to come and destroy us? And what are we going to do? Right? And Habakkuk really struggles with the question. I think it's one of the big books that talks to us about suffering. And patience. Because Habakkuk ends the book with saying, God, I will wait with you. I will endure this with you. Because ultimately you can carry us through this. This brings us next to Zephaniah. This sees God, you know, destroying nations and the day of the Lord is in sight and all these things can happen. Sorry. Okay, how much time? Okay. Let's see. Sorry, I've gotten way out of whack with my notes. All right. Somebody grab Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. Zechariah 1, 4 through 7. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the host of heaven and the housetop, those who worship and Swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcon. Those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. Verse 7, be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand, for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has invited his people. Yep. Looking forward to the day. Sorry, I'll, blip, I'll hop to these last ones real quick. So we have... Haggai, which is about the restoration beginning, they start actually rebuilding the temple. Zechariah continues said restoration, 
but it plays out much like Joel did in a very cosmic way. It's many visions. And then we end with Malachi. It's a call to return, be restored, come back to the covenant. And it really hits those themes Hosea was talking about, covenants and disruption. Thank you all for your attention. Sorry for my lack of prep tonight, but, well, I will, I guess, talk to you all here in a few minutes with the invitation.